part of it anyway that you find uh, in the program I thought well let's just beat these romantics at their own game they give us lists about what romanticism should be like let's try and do the same and today to start the talk I will do a little bit more of that uh, so a series of very short quotations from a variety of uh, major romantic figures mostly writers from all around Europe some of them are absolutely familiar, some of them are like you know, household words coming from the great house of romanticism around Europe. The German Novalis said, Die Welt muss romantisiert werden. The world must be made romantic. Then once more shall we discover its original meaning, 1798. In the same year, Novalis also said, The diligent study of life defines the romantic. Chateaubriand, a couple of, uh, well, about four years later, was writing about, was giving one of the first formulations of what in France they started calling le mal du siècle, so this kind of metaphysical suffering and dissatisfaction with existence. And uh, of course, he gave us one of the best characters that embodies le mal du siècle in the figure of René. Uh, but slightly untypical, it has to be said, artists of this moment uh, is another younger contemporary of Reynolds. This portrait painted again at the same time uh, in the same uh, year. Um, this is James Barry, uh, the Irish painter, uh, born in the 1740s, uh, so a direct contemporary of Fusli, um, and an artist who. And in this portrait, again, it's a private image, it's a small uh, painting, not, it seems, for public exhibition. And so it's less about the public proclamation of this kind of persona. But absolutely, this, the intensity of this gaze is one that does seem new uh, at this moment. Um, Barry, and Barry increasingly, thanks to essentially professional disappointments, um, cast himself in the role of the persecuted and misunderstood genius. Both to Hugo's romantic supporters in France and the classicists who opposed his artistic reforms, it was an assault on convention. The theatre had become the front line in the struggle against nearly two centuries of neoclassical principles in France. As such, it was a line the French romantics simply had to redraw if the transition from ancien regime values to the new age was to hold fast. The stage had represented the prize of French culture ever since the golden age of Louis XIV's 17th century reign on the throne, the age of Racine's great tragedies and Molière's comedies. As such, no campaign could afford to bypass such a prize. <coughs> My reasons for why I will turn to the so-called Bataille d'Hernani are today twofold. Firstly, I'd like to establish exactly why that February day is so important for the advent of Romanticism proper in France. The event allows me to sketch the series of varied artistic concerns through which we try to define this highly elastic artistic movement, readily highlighting the social consciousness and political relevance of romantic writing to French artists. Then symphony number 98 very cleverly in the slow movement embeds a discreet reminiscence of God Save the King. It starts And then it parts away from it. Those of you who know Haydn's music, one of his tricks compositionally is to keep on referring to the opening idea. And you get that form and figure all the way through that movement. So anybody who spotted it would go, God, say, uh, came all the way through the slow movement. So there's a very discreet allusion to it there. Composes a march for the Prince of Wales, who's very friendly with the Prince of Wales. Military symphony. If anybody ever asked what was Haydn's most popular symphony in London in the 1790s, it was the um, so called military symphony. It acquired that nickname at this time. It was popular because the slow march, uh, the slow movement, which is a march, evoked the terror of war. And we're delighted to welcome James to speak about German Romantic art in connection with various other arts of the 19th 
early 19th century. So German Romanticism is about interiority and intensity. And one of the problems about talking of it is that words are extraneous, they're exterior, and uh, veils of language can very often mitigate that experience. So it's been argued that the way to look at a Friedrich painting is in fact alone, contemplatively, without someone lecturing to you about it, ironically, and so on in that sense of trying to get into the depth, the inner room um, of the painting, rather than, as in the picturesque, of which Bath is replete, uh, being entertained by shapes and forms purely and simply for themselves. Pictures for Friedrich paintings were not entertainments. And I think that's why there's this quality of otherness about the things that he does depict, which we will explore. So who was Caspar David Friedrich? He was born in 1774 to a relatively well-off middle-class family, and although you know, they, writers like to say that the tragedy that afflicted the family, I'm not sure it was any much greater than the tragedies that afflicted most families in the 18th and early 19th centuries, and perhaps later, one thinks of Munch's family as well. The beginning of his spiritual quest, as he saw it, wasn't that heady moment when he shouted for proofs of God's existence at Oxford and received in return ashes and silence, it was when one May morning in 1809, when he was 16, he rushed for some reason out of his classroom at Eton and glimpsed and felt something. He could never say what. It was the breeze in the trees, but it was more than that. Or it was the sunlight playing on the blossoms, but it was not that. And he found himself in a state of ecstasy and tears at the same time. It seemed to be the shadow by which he usually means the radiance of beauty, a beauty not of the earth, but recognized or remembered from a higher state. From that moment on, he felt impelled to seek and find that beauty in everything he saw, and much more problematically, in every young woman he met. He realized fairly soon in every case that it wasn't in the young women, but not before he'd first of all made a fool of himself and men then made their own lives pretty miserable. I move on now to a man called Novalis, popularly called Novalis. His real name was Georg Philipp Friedrich Freiherr von Hardenberg. Uh, Short-lived, 29, I think, when he died uh, at the late, in the late 18th century. And he was the person who invented the motif of the blue flower. And this is the context in which this motif emerged. It's a novel uh, called Heinrich von Ofterdingen, uh, about a journey. Young Heinrich journeys with his mother from Eisenach to his grandfather's home in Augsburg and that constitutes the plot of the first part of the book. Uh, and during the course of what is uh, an educational pilgrimage of some kind, Heinrich meets an unusual and broad-ranging cast of characters, including a party of traveling merchants, a group of tr crusaders, a Saracen slave girl, an old miner, a hermit in an underground library, and the poet Klingsor and his daughter Matilde. <coughs> Heinrich's encounters and conversations with people from exotic worlds mark different stations on his educational journey, what the Germans called the Bildung. This is a form of Bildungsroman, a novel about the education of its hero. But Walpole's famous, of course, for this rather marvellous novel, 1765, The Castle of Otranto, the first Gothic novel, as it were, certainly in its second edition, the first novel to name itself as Gothic. And Walpole, in experimenting with this new critical form, which is actually a criticism of society coded into the words of a novel, Walpole effectively locates the Gothic hero, the ancestor of the Romantic hero, at the very centre of the Gothic novel through the figure of a chap called Manfred. He's the lord of Otranto, this great medieval robber baron, sometime vaguely in history between the 1000s and the 1400s. This man is the absolute ruler of a small, castle-centred kingdom somewhere on the Adriatic coast of Italy. Walpole never visited it, didn't know anything about it at all, just like the, just like the name. Imperious, ruthless, and obsessed with the continuation of his lineage, the inheritance of his family, Manfred is at first sight a stock feudal villain, more Tamburlaine than Hamlet. I think it better and better. Very impressed by the quality of the speakers. Um, a wonderful opportunity for us to be involved. Excellent.
we've just come to the end of the European Romanticism, 1780 to 1840 weekend, symposium of eight talks on the arts in Europe during those monumental and exciting uh, 60 years. Overall, it has been absolutely magnificent. The standard of, speak of speakers has been excellent throughout. The size of the audience has been startling and wonderful, and the general level of appreciation has been most gratifying. We're very proud to have put this event on for the public of Bath and the surrounding area this weekend in October 2012.